Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our next installment of the Health Talk Online, or Health Talks Online at the Richmond Public Library. I'm very excited to be sharing with you this next topic on Keto 101, or the Ketogenic Diet, or Keto Diet for short. Uh, there's been a lot of kind of craze and hype when it comes to keto and specifically uh, you might have associated keto with uh, weight loss and there is evidence when it comes to uh, ketogenic diet and weight loss but there's also a lot of other things that are kind of coming up when it comes to the evidence and the literature uh, regarding the ketogenic diet so i'm hoping for today's talk that we dive into understanding what the basics are with the keto diet and seeing what kind of evidence there is with certain conditions and really understanding the risks also behind it. So let's get started here. So yes, in, uh, in this presentation, we're gonna be talking about what the keto diet is and who can really benefit from the keto diet. And then we're gonna be touching base on some uh, research literature, as well as really understanding the considerations and contraindications, because there are risks involved when one does the keto diet. And as a disclaimer again, uh, this is not intended to replace any medical advice or meant to be relied on to treat, cure, or prevent any disease, illness, or medical condition. The attendance does not establish the patient-doctor relationship, and it is understood that if this is something that you would like to take on, that you would seek full medical clearance by a licensed physician. So my name is Dr. Romy Fung, and I am a practicing naturopathic physician at the Richmond Family Chiropractic in Richmond, British Columbia. I started off with my pre-medical studies in health sciences at Simon Fraser University, and went on to the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine to pursue a doctor of naturopathy. I am currently completing my master's in aging and health at Queen's University, and have been offered acceptance to the PhD in Aging and Health to be starting shortly uh, next month. And I'm quite excited to be pursuing uh, more of a route in diving deep into the research on uh, patients with dementia and improving care uh, of patients with dementia. Uh, as a naturopathic physician, I really love working with my patients in regards to establishing the foundations, understanding that it's not just taking you know, certain supplements, certain vitamins, or even certain medications, but rather understanding what you do on a daily basis. Because if you're not eating well, moving well, sleeping well, or even pooping well, likely there are chances down the road if this was chronic that it would be problematic and so talking about certain um, diets and lifestyles and behaviors are, would, is also something that I do a lot in my practice because it's not a matter of, or should I say that the magic doesn't just come from you know, seeing me for that certain hour, but rather what you do in between those visits on a daily basis. And so ketogenic diet isn't really much I talk about in um, my practice, but it's actually a focus in uh, when working with my patients with dementia. And even though I don't really intend on putting them into ketosis, uh, we, do, we do use elements of um, the keto diet and intermittent fasting to get the brain to be uh, working a lot more efficiently. And so this is where we start talking about elements of the keto diet. Uh, in my case, I call it, uh, under Dr. Dale Bredesen, the KetoFlex 12-3, meaning we're trying to get it more flexible 
and having my patient uh, fast for 12 hours with three hours prior to bed. And so before actually doing that, we need to really understand what it is that the ketogenic diet is asking for. So why don't we get started from here? So the keto diet isn't really all that new in the past uh, decade. In fact, there has been a, quite a few number of studies, uh, uh, scientific articles on keto published as early as 2000 and 2004. But it isn't, or it wasn't until about 2014 or even 2016 when everyone started searching up on Google uh, the keto diet and traffic really exponentially went up in 2018 and potentially even up to now. And so what is it about this diet that people are really looking for? Well, first off, we have to really understand what keto is. And before we can understand what keto and being in ketosis means, we must learn how our body usually works. So first off, our bodies, based on our usual traditional diets, utilize an energy called ATP. And ATP comes from the breakdown of glucose, which is the building block of uh, carbohydrates. So whatever we eat in terms of carbs, we digest and break down. And that broken down substance is glucose. And then glucose gets absorbed into the bloodstream from the intestines. Once it's in the blood, it requires insulin, which is a hormone that is secreted by the pancreas to really control blood sugar levels, but to also drive glucose into the cell so that the cell can utilize glucose and use it for fuel. So in other words, bottom line, whatever carbohydrates you eat gets broken down into its building block glucose for the body to absorb and utilize and insulin created by the pancreas aids in bringing glucose into the cells. But it isn't uh, when your body then breaks down the glucose and uses as fuel, um, that's how we get you know, everything else to be uh, moving and that's how we get our muscles to really engage and such. So without carbs, the body then turns into a different source of fuel, something called ketones. And thus, a ketogenic diet is literally a ketone-producing diet. It is low in carbohydrates, usually less than 50 grams a day. And that's kind of like the, the hallmark and the ballpark when it comes to aiming to be in ketosis. But everyone is actually quite different. And that would range from somewhere between 20 grams of carbs to 50 grams of carbs. But by drastically reducing your carb intake to under 50 grams per day, your body is then forced to use up any storage that's in there in the form of glycogen as energy. And once that storage is utilized and or used up, it eventually switches to using ketones as fuel. So you can see that the ketogenic diet on this chart here is less than 50 grams a day and is different from a low carb diet, which is between 50 and 150 grams a day. So by switching, the, by the body switching its main fuel source from glucose to ketones, it has to find a source of ketones. And the source of ketones is through the fat cells. So by breaking down fat cells into its building block, the fatty acid, fatty acids then are led to the liver through the blood and are converted to ketones for the body to then utilize as energy. And there are three different types of ketones that the liver produces. They're called acetone, acetoacetate, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And each one can actually be measured through different um, 
uh, methods and forms, which we'll talk about in a bit. So when does one get into ketosis? Under normal circumstances, we actually do produce a little bit of ketones and usually under 0.1 or less than 0.1 um, millimoles per liter. And in our state or our definition of ketosis is then generally defined as anything greater than 0.2. And that's where kind of a bit of the nutritional ketosis begins. But it isn't really until 0.5 that we really start seeing the, the threshold being passed. So some sources will say that 0.5 is the threshold and some will say 0.2. But for um, a lot of kind of um, literature, it usually ranges between 0.5 and 1.5. That's usually kind of the, the goal right there. But of course, each person is going to be quite different. And to get into a state of ketosis, it generally takes some people two to four days if you eat 20 to 50 grams of uh, carbs per day. And for other people, it might actually take up to two weeks before they can actually get their body to be adjusted into ketosis. And there are many factors, not just the carbohydrate factor where you're eating less than 50 grams of carbs, but um, besides daily carb intake, you're also your daily fat intake and protein intake can also kind of um, affect your level of ketosis. Also, the amount of exercise you do, if your body's really using up those stores, those glycogen stores, and your metabolism, which is also related to your age. Now, at the far end there, where the red is, uh, ketoacidosis, of course, we don't really want to get to that because that's a life-threatening problem that usually affects people with diabetes. And this occurs when the body starts breaking down fat at a rate that is way too fast. And then the body or the blood becomes very acidic. And when it becomes very acidic, a lot of other things happen from misfolding of proteins and other things that may in fact be very life-threatening and you would be rushed to uh, emergency. So in this case, how would you know if you're in ketosis? Well, there are a couple of ways, or actually a few ways, you can um, tell if you yourself are in ketosis. First off, subjectively. Some people actually feel it when they're in ketosis. Maybe when you get used to the feeling, you know for sure, for certain, that you are in ketosis. But of course, this feeling can vary greatly from person to person. But some of the, uh, the symptoms that you might feel while you're in ketosis can be uh, appetite suppression. You might notice that your appetite is significantly reduced. And um, if you don't feel the need to eat as often as before, then someone might think that they might be in ketosis. Another is increased focus and energy. Because when you get into ketosis, a large part of the brain starts burning ketones instead of glucose. And in some sources, um, they suggest that the brain actually works better with ketone bodies versus glucose. And in that case, being a potent fuel source for the brain, uh, the brain then becomes a lot more efficient. This is possibly one of the reasons why this is being tested in a medical setting to really treat brain diseases and conditions such as uh, concussions, um, dementia, and even seizures. Therefore, it may not be surprising that people who have done the ketogenic diet long-term often report uh, clarity and improved brain function. And lastly, there might be even short-term decreases in um, athletic performance. When the body's getting used to kind of switching from glucose to ketones, it may not be uh, used to it as well. And thus your performance, especially if you're an athlete and you're training, that you might get some decreases in strength and endurance. 
Then there's the somewhat objectively um, kind of telltale reason. And that is you can smell that you have this so-called nail polish remover breath or even slightly fruity. Now, I have never talked with anyone who was ever in ketosis, so I could never say this for myself, but um, I could probably understand what they mean if I get a chance to really, you know, speak with someone who has, who is currently in ketosis. And I don't know if that would be very pleasant <laughs> or very um, just... Yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that, but um, the breath can also be a telltale, sound, a telltale sign for someone who is in ketosis. Then there's the objective measures where you can objectively measure how much or how many, uh, how much ketones are in your blood, breath, and urine. So one of the ways to really measure ketones is through blood. Just like similar to how you would take a, a blood sugar test where you have the, uh, the finger prick. Uh, same thing can apply and there are different technologies to measure ketones. And for most of the blood ketone uh, objective tests, it measures the beta hydroxybutyrate that's predominant in your blood. And so what's really great about these measurements is you can really take them at any time and you can take the, the measurement uh, you can bring your machine at any location and it's quite it's more precise accurate reliable than compared to a breath test or even a urine test but of course you also have to weigh in the risks that it's a finger prick and that the meter and the lancets and even the strips that collect the blood may in fact be quite expensive. Then there's the breath test, where just like the blood test, you can take it at any time. And this measures the acetone in your breath. But breath tests aren't really as accurate as blood tests, but it can still correlate fairly closely. But unlike the blood test, a breath test is non-invasive. You can easily take it on the go, and uh, measure your current ketone production, whereas uh, where we talk about the urine test, a urine test reflects typically your past ketone production because you're, uh, you already had it in the blood and then it's filtered into the urine. However, uh, a breath ketometer can potentially be quite expensive and that your breath, uh, your breath reading can actually quite be uh, be variable based on certain aspects of your day. Uh, it can change quite suddenly if you have um, a small carbohydrate snack or um, exercise. So these are things that you had to take into consideration when measuring ketones through the breath. Then there's the urine test, which is probably the most portable and the most uh, inexpensive, where you uh, urinate on a strip or you um, urinate and dip the strip in the urine and wait for the color to change and then you read the, um, the label accordingly. Of course there are some factors that may in fact make this the most inaccurate uh, test especially if the strips become defective when they get exposed to moisture or damp environments. And these are only approximate uh, ketone levels. So it gives you a range per color or based on the color. And it also quite varies with the fluid intake. The less hydrated you are, um, the less diluted the ketones, and you might actually get higher levels because the ketones are not as diluted. So looking at this, we're gonna take a look at how ketogenic diets, keto, um, is applied in quite a few of the um, conditions and the literature involved in it. One might think that keto diet and weight loss really go hand in hand, and there is uh, a decent number of research to uh, share that, but note that ketone levels and fat levels are not correlated. The higher the ketone levels are, 
does not mean that it is associated with greater fat loss. In fact, most of the research and the clinical importance of uh, the ketogenic diet only really wants you to be in a certain range between 1.5 and 3.0 um, millimoles per liter to uh, being ideal for maintain, uh, maintaining ketosis and in regards to uh, fat loss. But um, some people correlate fat loss with the fact that you're utilizing the, um, the fat to create the ketone bodies, others might actually feel that it's the appetite that also is affected in the weight loss. People who eat less carbohydrates, usually, it usually means that they would have to replace the carbohydrates they usually eat with either protein or even fat, which is more uh, satiating. And ketones may actually have an appetite reducing effect. There was actually the study done, uh, a two-year open label, so meaning that the participants were not in a double-blind study and they were not randomized. In fact, uh, this study recruited 349 overweight or obese volunteers with type 2 diabetes and they got to choose if they wanted to be in the, the keto diet or the usual diabetic treatment. And of course, more people actually chose the keto, but there are also considerations about why not to choose keto. It's probably one of the most restrictive of diets and quite challenging as well. But that gives the study kind of that idea as to, okay, let's see what kind of results happen from there. And so they followed these um, volunteers for two years and they took a lot of measurements uh, at the one year mark, the 12 month mark, and the 24 months, the two year mark. And ensuring that um, they are following the ketogenic diet. So it is monitored through um, electronics. And what they found was quite interesting in that, um, I know the words are quite small here, but uh, I'm gonna go through each one of these one by one. Uh, all these graphs are based on the group that has conducted the, the keto diet, not the, um, the regular usual care for diabetes. And what they found was in the top left corner, the weight in the first dot starting from the left was the beginning. The second point in the middle is at one year. And then the, the third point at the far right of the graph is at two years. And they found that there was a significant decrease in weight in the top left-hand corner. The top right-hand corner, uh, graph B, measures, measured their central abdominal fat. And quite astoundingly, they found that it does decrease after one year, and it kind of gets maintained uh, within the, the following year afterwards. The next two, C and D, measures the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, and it really does go down by just uh, about a point-ish, but still that's quite significant in that it gets maintained afterwards. Then there's other measurements, um, E, which is the uh, alanine aminotransferase, which has more to do with the liver, and F to do with C-reactive protein, which is your systemic inflammation marker, and that too gets decreased. So over the span of two years, we see quite a bit of decrease in these kind of measures associated with improvements of uh, blood glucose, insulin, HbA1c, weight, blood pressure, triglycerides, liver function, inflammation, and even reduced dependence upon medication. In fact, the, um, the CCI, which is the intervention group, also had a higher prevalence of diabetes reversal and remission compared to the control group following the standard diabetes care program. So there's a lot to be said about this. So thus, a ketogenic diet may actually be helpful for diabetes and blood sugar control. Uh, we've seen with that one big study, even though it wasn't um, 
randomized, it really sets the bar to uh, or warrants for further studies, but it gives us a, a decent idea as to what to expect. And it reduced elevated uh, glucose and insulin levels in those with uh, diabetes or prediabetes. But even so, just regarding blood sugar alone may not actually be holistic when it comes to cardiovascular health. It's not really clear that a keto diet leads to an improvement in cardiovascular health outside the impacts of weight loss and blood sugar. Of course, it gives us kind of that feedback that uh, there are elements that can be improved. And thus, further testing is also warranted in this case, because it's not really just uh, about cholesterol and blood sugar, though those are really major components, but how the body responds and communicates. And that can actually be measured through testing. And that's one of the tests that I do in, uh, in my practice, something called the, the pulse test where not only do I measure um, HDL, which is the good cholesterol, and HbA1c, which is a measure for uh, overall blood sugar levels, but it also measures quite a bit of the inflammatory markers and communication about the immune system, if the immune system is working in the, um, the blood vessels, if it's overworking or if it's underworking. And that also tells me how much damage is happening in the blood vessels. So we have to take this with a grain of salt. And of course, with the keto diet, because we're utilizing um, our fat storage and increasing circulating free fatty acids, that could actually be potentially harmful when they accumulate because they can actually damage certain cells such as the pancreas, um, muscle, and liver cells, as well as the endothelial or the lining of the blood vessel. So we have to be quite careful in balancing the benefits and the risks. There has been five studies done when it comes to the ketogenic diet and Alzheimer's, but within the five, only one utilized a full keto diet and four utilized a supplement, MCT oil or medium chain triglyceride oil, which also has the effect and benefit of supporting your body in getting into ketosis. These studies have been quite small and none of these have been very long term. So really at this point, little can be said of what a keto diet can do for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. But at the same time, I also have to think about if I were to put my patient in a ketogenic diet, which is very restrictive, they could also be at increased risk for, for malnutrition because eating may become challenging as the disease advances. And a keto diet may also cause a reduction in appetite and that could risk for certain um, nutrient deficiencies. So these are things that can complicate um, having myself implement a keto diet in my patients with uh, dementia. And thus we go through that keto flex 12-3 and variations of um, ketogenic and intermittent fasting. Pro possibly one of the, the bigger studies out there when it comes to the keto diet has to involve epilepsy, those who do have seizures. And there has actually been a Cochrane review in 2018 that really measured um, the reduction in seizure frequency in children with epilepsy or childhood epilepsy. Uh, of course, quality is not the greatest at this point. It's really hard with the ethics and um, kind of the, the standards of what is to be safe in putting anyone in ketosis. But looking at 11 studies, they really showed that it really does warrant um, further studies showing promising results for the use of keto diet in epilepsy. But not just epilepsy. In various studies, the ketogenic diet has shown promising results in a variety of uh, brain or neurological disorders, and not just with epilepsy and dementia, but um, ALS, 
traumatic brain injury and concussion, as well as, uh, what do I have here? Uh, epilepsy, dementia, ALS, traumatic brain injury, and metabolic uh, brain disorders. Of course, even though the evidence is really promising at this point, there are considerations for one, if they are considering uh, doing keto in the first place. Of course, first and foremost has to be those who are diabetic or even pre-diabetic and are on medications. Because when you're restricting yourself from carbohydrates, your blood sugar levels are gonna go quite low. And if you're taking medication, such as insulin or oral hypoglycemic agents that makes the blood sugar even lower, you're risking yourself to be put in very severe hypoglycemia. And so this is something that you want to be talking with, um, with your medical doctor or physician. Of course, there are also contraindications for keto. Specifically, because with the ketogenic diet, you're putting your body in a state of ketosis, where you're launching a lot of the free fatty acids into the blood, if your body is not set or not programmed well to work with this increased level of fatty acids in the blood, things will happen. And that's why the ketogenic diet is contra uh, contraindicated in patients with pancreatitis, so inflammation of the pancreas, uh, liver failure, disorders of fat metabolism, and deficiencies of certain enzymes that contribute to um, lipid metabolism. And so these are the ones listed below. And there are lipid metabolism uh, disorders such as Gaucher's disease, uh, Tay-Sachs disease that involves lipids. And that if you don't have enough of the enzymes to break down the lipids, then you wouldn't want to be considering doing keto in the first place, or at least going full out on keto, because that would really put a big burden on the body. So again, if you do have diabetes or prediabetes and are considering the keto diet, knowing that there is some evidence about controlling your blood sugar levels, it's best that you speak out to your physician, dietitian, or both about your intentions because a keto diet drastically decreases your carbohydrate intake, your medications need to be adjusted and monitored, as well as your, your blood sugar and also other measurements too regarding um, hydration, um, uh, electrolytes, etc. And speaking of hydration and electrolytes, there's something that's really common, something called the keto flu. And that usually happens for people uh, starting off the keto diet and usually in the first uh, first to fourth weeks of trying the keto diet that they may experience fatigue, nausea, bad breath, intestinal discomfort, headaches, brain fog, or other, condition, or other symptoms. And this is often temporary and we call it the keto flu or even the low carb flu. And to really mitigate this or to minimize the risk from this to be happening, you wanna make sure that you are getting proper hydration because you really do need a lot more water than usual to really break down the fats and also um, a lot of the, um, the carbs that we might eat, especially when it comes to fruits and vegetables, have greater water content. And if we're decreasing those kind of foods, we're also decreasing our fluid intake from the foods, as well as having electrolytes and, and also fiber. Fiber being quite big and that it would actually induce constipation because we aren't really consuming much of the carbohydrates, which may also contain quite a bit of the, um, the fiber that we need to get our bowels moving. And so this is where even supplementing with psyllium husk can be a good option in divided doses, but also increasing fluid intake about two to three glasses or 500 to 750 milliliters throughout the day to alleviate the constipation as well as the keto flu.
Then there are also other considerations that have happened, and there is evidence that um, countless studies show that the diet is associated with many complications that often lead to emergency room visits and admissions due to dehydration, electrolyte disturbances, and uh, extremely low blood sugar or hypoglycemic levels. So this is where you also have to be, be aware of that. Pretty much ultimately, that I really do highly suggest that you consult with your medical doctor or physician before you consider doing the ketogenic diet, especially if you have a concurrent condition such as diabetes. Then there's this part about supplementation. There's a lot of new supplements coming out uh, regarding ketones and exogenous ketones. And there's other um, supplements that you may have heard of, such as um, some people will use coconut oil or even MCT oil to really almost quote unquote jumpstart the state of ketosis. And the whole idea of taking these exogenous ketones is to put that body in a state of ketosis regardless of where you're at. So this might actually be um, supportive and helpful for those who have a really hard time consuming less than 50 grams of carbohydrates, for example, and really need that added support. But some people also use exogenous ketones. And when I mean by exogenous, it means ketones that are made outside the body uh, the ketones that we make inside the body is what you call endogenous ketones. So whenever I refer to exogenous ketones, think of it as a supplement that is containing ketones so that you can take in to the body. And that's uh, been investigated in use for um, exercise performance, epilepsy and seizures, cognition, and psychiatric disorders. And overall, it's theoretical that it helps support the body, but at this moment, it's not really highly shown in a lot of studies. There's not that many out there at this time, but um, in comparing having the endogenous ketones and the ketogenic diet versus the exogenous ketones, most studies done right now has been on the body being able to produce its own ketones. So there's not really that much evidence in supporting the body getting into ketosis at this point. It is theoretical. Some people will swear by it. Some people will not feel too much from it. So in summary, we covered a, quite a bit in regards to some heavy materials. So I decided to make this short. Uh, the ketogenic diet consists of a very low carb diet that can potentially be very restrictive. And though a strict ketogenic diet might help with various brain related diseases such as epilepsy, glioma, so these are uh, growths and uh, cancers, uh, cognitive decline and psychiatric conditions, but for the most part, the evidence is still preliminary. But there is some level of evidence that a keto diet may reduce levels of insulin and blood sugar, which is beneficial in those who are pre-diabetic and diabetic. But the bottom line is that a keto diet is not a wonder cure. And it is not the only option either. In fact, there's really no one best diet out there. The best diet I find is based on your needs, your lifestyle, and just working with you in regards to personalized medicine. So that's something to really think about there. We wanna thank you for taking your time this morning to join us here and for listening in. Now, before you get to questions, I just want to make uh, let you know that um, for those who are new to the talk, um, I have my website at www.drromifengnd.com, and you're more than welcome to access the website. I do make posts um, on the blog, and for more information about what I do as a naturopathic physician, as well as what naturopathic medicine is, I suggest you check out the website. Uh, I also have uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. 
uh, like my Facebook, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and follow me on Instagram for more information and for the videos uh, that are recorded here. And if you have any other personal questions uh, outside of the talks, that you're more than welcome to contact me at, uh, by email at contact at drromifungnd.com. And just as a last thing, that we do have future talks coming up. Um, I believe that we are going to be staying with the Mondays at the Richmond Public Library. Uh, here we are on July 27th, talking about Keto 101. The following Monday is BC Day, so we're not going to be having a talk there. But the following weeks are all set, with August 10th being Supplement Truths and Myths, August 17th, Osteoporosis, August 24th on Gut Health and Parkinson's. We're going to top that off at the end of August with a Q&A where you get to bring in your own questions. All right.